So tonight, I'm really excited to start a new collection of talks that's going to carry us through a good part of the year. We'll take breaks here and there, but we're really just going to be looking at some of the stories from the Old Testament of the, of the Bible, like some of the oldest stories, maybe for you or maybe for others, some of the most famous stories. But I just want to invite you that anytime you're here or for anyone who comes along with you, I want you to know we're going to be telling stories as if you're hearing them for the first time. And so if you're coming in and you don't really feel like you know anything or if you've got friends that don't know anything about church or not sure they want to try church, I want you to know we're going to do everything we can, not just with the hospitality as they walk in, but also with the talks to make them feel like, oh, I can, I can listen in on this and I can, I can make decisions about what I think about these things. And so we really want to be intentional about you are free to belong before you believe. And if you are already a believer in God, a follower of Jesus, and you're saying, I've heard all these stories before, here's my commitment to you. So have I. And so as I come before you in teaching each and every single week, I want you to know that I am going to be praying, I'm going to be seeking God, and I'm going to be saying, God, would you show me something new so that I can share it with your people? That's my commitment. And so... And, and I've been so excited knowing that this is where we're going. I have been reading ahead in stories that I have known most of my life, and I feel like I'm learning brand new things about something like creation. All right, so we're going to be just be opening up and talking about the creation story tonight from Genesis chapter 1. A couple of things that we do here. We're going to put the scriptures that I read on the screen. I sent you an email this week if you're signed up on our email list to, so that you could read ahead and uh, make, begin to think about the scriptures and, and then you can you know, fact check me later on if you want. You know, he, he Make sure I got it right. And uh, if you do not have a Bible, I just want to tell you, we've got them available now as you walk in and as you walk out. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you are welcome to take one with you. And uh, we just want to make sure that everyone has access to that even as we, as we put things on the screen. I love when we get an opportunity to talk because I, I love origin stories. You know, it's sometimes we give these little prompts on ask someone about this or ask someone about that. But um, when you go to coffee with somebody or wherever you go and you're, you're getting to know someone for the first time, isn't it fun to hear their origin stories? You know what I mean? And so for me, I was born in the 70s, all right? And uh, so, but I, I don't remember the 70s, not because I was tripped out on anything, but because I was born in 76, so I was very young. And then the 80s is my childhood. All right, so if you want to know a little bit of my origin story, has anyone seen the show Stranger Things on, on Netflix? Yeah. Minus the demons and the other world, the alternate realities, that's a little bit of my origin story. It was... Every day after school, we were on the bikes, hanging out in the, in the neighborhood and, and just going wherever we want. We didn't have phones. We didn't have iPhones. Uh, we came home by where the sun was in the sky, all right? Our parents said basically, you know, go and we'll see you at dinner time. Didn't matter how far I went, but if it just so long as I was back at the appropriate time. I don't think we would ever do with kids today what we were doing in the 80s, all right? And we were out. We were, we were doing all the things. If I were to spend more time with you, I would tell you about my, my sports teams. They're, they're very important in my life and how I became. But from where I live in the States, my sports teams make no sense at all. I don't know if some of you are like that. Maybe you're from Aberdeen, but in, you said you root for a team from Glasgow for some reason. I don't know how that happens. Maybe it changed for you in uni. Whatever it is, we all have those types of things in our origin stories. We love as a society now, we love biographies and biopics. It seems like on Netflix and other streaming things, every week there's a new story about a new person, someone we've maybe wondered about all their lives, or maybe they're trying to get their stories out before someone else tells them. I don't know exactly how that works, but we love those things. We love origin stories because you learn something about the person from the time before you even knew them. And tonight is the ultimate origin story. It's our collective origin story. It, it's more than just anything else. We, we all find ourselves in what is the story of God. In fact, in Hebrew, the first word of the Bible would be translated origin. We know it as in the beginning. But more important than the record of how the earth and universe came into existence, the creation story tells us about the character and nature of God and what he wants us to know about him from the very beginning. So if you know nothing else about God, 
if you know nothing else about how the universe came to be, Genesis 1 tells us so very much. And it starts, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, in Hebrew, it's just the, those first three words, in the beginning, the word origin. It's interesting that the Bible just assumes the existence of God. You say, if you're new to church or new to the Bible, you say, where do I go in the Bible to, to prove that God exists? No, the Bible never argues for it. It just assumes that you will get it. And one of the ways that it assumes that you will get it is that creation makes it obvious. According to Scripture, creation makes it obvious. The Scriptures never argue for the existence of God. Think about it. When you write your memoir one day, one day the show will not start out arguing for your existence it will be obvious by who you are and the things that you've done creation is the most significant illustration that there is a God and it contains within it millions of illustrations about who he is in the beginning of the Bible the biblical narrative there is God he's already there we are entering into his story and our collective beginning as mankind, he is already present. And throughout this evening, I want to pull out some little things, some little, some little nuggets that I believe are universal truths from the things that we encounter in Genesis chapter 1. Can I tell you, he is already present. What does that mean? You never walk into a place that he's not already there. You never encounter a person that he does not already know and value. You got a big meeting this week? Maybe an opportunity where you're going to go into a, a classroom full of people you don't know or you've got a proposal in a room full of people you don't know. You're walking into a place where you've never been. Can I tell you, God is already present in that room. In the beginning, God created. Genesis 1 is the story of an immediate act of our creative God. The world was not created out of necessity. It was not created out of pre-existing materials. It was created ex nihilo, out of nothing, is the Latin phrase, ex nihilo. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Verse 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the world in verse 2 seems to be out of order or incomplete. Out of order needs to be organized or, or it's incomplete and needs to be completed. Listen, there are so many theories and scholarly opinions that we could never cover about Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, but I am fascinated by them. There's even this, this whole theory of thought that, that there was this massive event in between verse 1 and verse 2. Like, where do people come up with that? All, all kinds of different places. One is called the gap theory. It's the idea that perhaps in between Genesis 1-1 and, and verse 2, that that was the time when some of the angels rebelled, when Lucifer rebelled, became Satan, and took a bunch of people with him. Maybe that's the truth. There are so many theories. It's like, where do people come up with them? But here's the thing this evening. Rather than zooming in on the opinions of philosophers and the debates of scientists, what I would like to do is zoom out. Because when we zoom in on particular details we can get lost we can get lost in the weeds of creation science or whether or not evolution played a part we can get into the weeds of the framework of the text and the literary nuances we can discuss the age of the earth whether or not it was literal days when god spoke the world into existence or if it's figurative all of those kinds of things and if you buy the coffee i am happy to discuss them with you believe me but I think it's way more valuable for us to zoom out and learn some things about the character and nature of God. And when you zoom out on the creation story, you find out some amazing things about him. In the beginning, God created. Here's the first thing about God. The universe is finite. God is infinite. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's called the Alpha and Omega later on, the beginning and end, as a reference to the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Here's why I love this attribute. Because this attribute becomes an adjective. You could say it like this. God is infinite in love. He is infinite in mercy. 
not giving us what we deserve. He is infinite in grace. He is infinite in forgiveness. He is infinite in knowledge. And more importantly, in wisdom, the knowledge, the application of the knowledge. Another way of saying that God is infinite is that he is limitless. And I take great comfort. I know this is a hard one. But I take great comfort in a God that cannot be explained away. Creation can be measured. God cannot be. And if I could explain him with boundaries and borders, then what need would I have for him? In fact, it's the things about my life that I cannot explain where I find God to be greater than anything I've ever known. Something else about God, he's not just infinite and limitless, he's, he's sovereign. He's in charge. It's his creation and he's in charge. There was a beginning moment. Was it 10,000 years ago or 10 million years ago? I could give you my opinion, but I would be a fool to hold my opinion in a zoomed-in detail in a way that would create division between us. What I can tell you this, there was nothing until God created. That Latin phrase, ex nihilo, has been used for centuries to say this. God didn't need matter or other material. He didn't require blueprints or plans. He spoke, and it all came into being. The fact that God has the ability to create something out of nothing is one of the most hopeful things about who he is and who we are. You can be talking to someone who's atheist or agnostic. You can be talking to someone who struggles with addiction or immorality. You can talk with someone who's a cheat or a liar. You could have given up on them. You could have given up on all hope for your life. And in a moment, you can start fresh with God because he can do anything out of nothing. He's infinite in grace and mercy. Your life already has a whole lot of something. But even if you feel like it's nothing, he can create something out of that. God begins to step in and speak. We zoom in on that, for, zoom, zoom out on that for just a moment. Have you ever felt like your life is out of order or just incomplete? What do you do with that? Do you just try harder? Do you go to the bookstore? Do you... Go to Amazon, you listen to a podcast and hope you can just find the right piece of knowledge to apply. Listen, no one can put your life back together like God can. He takes the disorder and brings order. He takes the incomplete and makes it complete. And that's what he does in creation. Verses 3 and 4 say this, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning the first day. So day one, as God's putting everything in order and creating, there's light and darkness. Day two, there's the sky and the waters. Day three, there's land and vegetation. On day four, there's the sun, moon, and stars. On day five, there's the fish and the birds. On day six, there's the land animals and mankind. You can see order being created out of the chaos. I feel like I would have messed this up. I feel like I would have somehow gotten things out of order somehow. But God did not make the land and vegetation without first making it so they could be watered. He didn't make the fish before he had somewhere to put them. He didn't make the sun, moon, and stars before he had a sky to put them in. Albert Einstein said once in referring to the order in the universe, he says, God does not play dice. Science is not anti-God. In fact, it's the continued empirical pursuit of the creator and designer of the universe. The further you go, the more you see him. I did some reading on the subject of quantum physics this week, so you don't have to. It's the study of matter and energy at its most fundamental form. I read from Einstein, I read from Newton, I read from Planck some of the mathematicians that surround their work, it was just like, it just mind blowing. I had to read everything over and over and over again. But time and again, the most brilliant minds from countries all over the world come back to a similar conclusion. All of these little pockets of energy that are unpredictable in their movements, they are finite in their measurements, even if mankind hasn't figured out how to measure them yet. In other words, they are finite but we know God to be in, to be infinite and he is holding it all together friends as we zoom out what we learn about God is that he handles every detail of our lives and he can hold it all together like nothing and no one else can something else we learn about God from looking at creation is that he's a designer 
There are so many examples from nature and the animal kingdom of how one organism feeds off another, one animal enhances an another. I get fascinated by bioluminescence, plus I just really like saying the word. I think it sounds really cool, makes me sound smart. What's bioluminescence? Like things that glow in the dark. All right, if, if, if I'm going to a show or if I'm out on the street and they're giving away those glow-in-the-dark bracelets, all right, I'm, I'm up for that, okay? Just, just so you think I'm not trying to make myself look so smart, I just think things that glow in the dark are cool, all right? Like the, like the fish way down in the deep that we can see that somehow glow in the darkness and can see through darkness that none of us can, like the mushrooms in the forest that glow at night and, and feed other insects and animals. I think that kind of thing is just incredible, I still haven't seen this yet, but in Scotland, we are just on the edge of being able to see the Aurora Borealis. If you've seen the Northern Lights, I'm jealous. I just want you to know. I was reading about this this week, and here's the deal. Charged particles from the sun, 93 million miles away, they leave the sun, and they come our direction. It will take them 40 hours to reach the earth. And when they get into our atmosphere, that is when they create those most beautiful lights. And did you know different colors are found at different heights? The green is always going to be this many miles from the sky. The blue is always going to be this many miles from the earth. You can see between 60 and 150 miles high. That is... ...off an object towards your eye... A lens focuses the light towards your, the retina at the back of your eye. Your retina is full of photoreceptors and, and rods and cones. Photoreceptors called rods and cones. Your eye has a lot of these things. A hundred million rods and six million cones, respectively. Now, have you had to think really hard today about making your eyes work? Do you have to say to your brain, make them work? No. No. Because the designer has already put it in place. And by the way, once it goes into your brain, the way that it computes things and makes it so that you know what you're looking at is absolutely amazing. From your brain to your bones to your cells, every piece of you has been put together intricately. It's no wonder the psalmist would say, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. When you read through the days of creation and Genesis, you'll find that the writing resembles a poem. And I love that. The creation account is not given to us in bullet points. Rather, it's a form of creative writing. That doesn't diminish it as history. Rather, I think it enhances it. God is not just the creator of the structure and bones of the universe. Here's what I want you to know from God from Genesis chapter 1. God is an artist trying to do everything I can to rewrite maybe the picture you have in your brain of this really, really old man with this really, really long white beard who's staying as far away from you as he can. I'm telling you, that is not who God is. He is an artist, and he wants us to recognize that part of his personality from the very first page of the book. Genesis 1 has rhythm to it, repeated phrases. You read over and over again, and God said. You also see the phrase, and it was so. And God said, and it was so, and it was good. And God said, and it was so, and it was good. God looks over all his creation and calls it good. And then there's evening and there's morning the first day. And evening and there's morning the second day. And God said, and it was good, and it was so, and there was evening and there was morning, day three, day four, day five. Listen, some Churches and some Christians have proven to be uncomfortable around artists. When God says from the very beginning, this is who I am from the very first page of my book, the writers, the musicians, the painters, the illustrators, the inventors, the photographers, the than they ever thought they could. They should be encouraged to dream new dreams and to take chances, and they should be invited to contribute to make a difference in the community and to share the gospel wherever they are in the world. Instead, many feel like they're told to leave the church or made to feel like they need to leave the church and come back when they calm down. Rather, the creation of God was made full of potential to keep on creating. God is a creator, and he wants us to be creating. He's an artist. Creation was not perfect. 
By that I mean it's not static. Creation was created to create. And creation continues to adapt and transform, and that's not a threat to who God is. It's a greater reflection of who he is. Everything has its origin in him. And we're invited to steward it all under his sovereignty within his design. All of his creation demonstrates his power and artistry, but the capstone was to make something in his image. Verse 26 says this, God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, if you were to just read these couple of verses without any other context, you might be wondering, why does he say the word image so much? Let's make man or mankind in our image. First of all, notice this is huge and very important, and we'll have to come back to it with more time on another evening. But there's an us and an our in this passage. Let us make man in our image. Who is there? The us is God in three distinct persons. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in perfect unity and relationship together. Now, what's the purpose of an image? If I say to you, let me show you an image of my wife, what does that mean? probably means I'm going to pull out the phone. I don't carry, like, pictures around in my wallet anymore. Does anybody still do that, even though I was born in the 70s? I'm going to pull out my phone, and I'm going to show you a picture of my wife. Now, just so you know, there is a folder of approved pictures that I am allowed to post or to show people, right? Before I go to Instagram to brag on how amazing and lovely and wonderful she is, there is a particular folder that I have access to. And sometimes I'll say, I need you to put something new in the folder. Now, for me, we've been married 26 years. I don't think she's ever taken a bad picture in her life. However... She wants me to give you the best image. I can describe the things she likes to do. I can tell you that she likes to hike. I can tell you that she likes pink. I can tell you all kinds of things about her. But the very best thing I can do, the most clear thing I can do, is to show you her image. And We're talking about mankind and human origins, but let's make it personal, okay? You were created in the image of God to be an image of God. You were created to be a reflection of him. You were created to know God, to be loved by him, and to love him in return. And as you show him to others, he gets the glory. God didn't create the world because he needed anything. He is all-sufficient. He has everything he needs. Why did he create? He created us in his image to be his image so that he would get glory. From the universe and creation, the the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims his handiwork. Isn't there awe and reverence when you see the northern lights? Isn't there awe and reverence when you see the, the stars in the sky or the moon or whatever it might be? The heavens declare the glory. The skies proclaim his handiwork. The skies make it obvious there is a God, there is a designer who who is present. And then every person that he's ever made can give him glory. The scripture says the earth is full of the weight of God. It's full of his weight. It would be obvious that there is a God because this creation is so amazing, so intricate, so well designed. You can zoom way in. You can find millions and millions of details. And you can zoom out and you can see the character and nature of God. In Isaiah, God says, go to the north, the south, the east, and west. Do not withhold Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You were created in the image of God to be an image so that he would get the glory. It's all about him. And that scripture is the mission and the And for the follower of Jesus, that is our mission. And for the church, it's to go out and to bring people in so that they may find themselves in relationship with God. Ultimately, you were created for a relationship. 
you were created to be loved. And I hope you will notice this in the way you're reminded when we leave a service. We want to make it a, a constant benediction. Be loved. Because that's what you were created for. You were created to be loved by God. You were created for a relationship with him. You were created in his image. And the purpose of your life is to give him glory. From one Hebrew poem, from one elevated piece of writing, the very first page of God's book, we can discover so many things as we zoom out about the character and nature of God, but maybe even more important than that to you is that you discover why you're here and what your purpose is. I think everyone at some point questions that. Everyone walking these streets, everyone all around the earth wonders at some point, why am I here? Do I even matter? What's my life for? And from page one of the Bible, you are here to be loved by God. You are here to be in a relationship with God. You are here and your purpose and whatever you have been gifted to do by him and however you are wired is to give him glory. You, you find your origin story in his story and you find incredible joy and delight and fulfillment when setting your course on a relationship with him. There are a lot of fair questions that we get from the creation account in Genesis. Questions like, how old is the earth? Did God speak and make a little bit happen and then everything else happened after that? What, there are all kinds of varying opinions and philosophies on all kinds of different things, but the more important thing is to zoom out to know that God created out of nothing. He spoke the world into existence and he created you to be loved, to be known by him in relationship and to give him glory. Where do you find Jesus in creation? Well, he's not just one of the us and the our, let us make man in our image. But another writer in the New Testament gives us a little bit more. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 says this. The Apostle Paul's writing. He says, he, that being Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And, all, and in him, all things hold together. Where do you find Jesus in creation? Well, along with God the Father, he is already there. What's the big deal about Jesus? Well, as he comes to earth, he actually shows us what God is like. He shows us the character and nature of God in the flesh as he welcomes people to himself as he as he welcomes and enjoys the presence of kids as he as he is generous and compassionate to people that the rest of the culture and the rest of the community are being unkind to the way he takes his time with people the way he the way he spends his days with the father in all of those ways and in so many more as we follow the stories of Jesus we find the character and nature of God of someone who cares about every single person that he comes in contact with the image of the, invisible God, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That doesn't make him created. Firstborn of all creation is, is status. In other words, he is the most important. And it was by him that all things were created in heaven and on earth. He, Jesus shows up in physical form to show us what God is like and, so that we, and to be the catalyst for us to have a relationship with God by his dying on the cross and being risen 
from the dead. So from the very beginning of the book, we learn the character and nature of God from his creation. And we learn that he cares so much about his creation and he holds it all together. But we know that he loves us, that he wants a relationship with us, and he created us to bring him glory. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Creation can sound like such a big story. I mean, it's the origin of the earth. It's the origin of man. But it's personal for us. God didn't create because he needed anything. And so you're not here on planet Earth because God is not all sufficient without you. Rather, the amazing thing is that you're here on planet Earth because he wanted you here. He doesn't just love you by default because that's who he is. He loves you because of who you are, who he created you to be. And he doesn't just love you, he likes you. And I know there's moments for many of us where we don't even like ourselves. I know there's moments where we're so uncertain of ourselves, where our lives feel completely out of control, completely disordered. But the God of the universe says, I want to take personal care of you. If, you're no, if you know him, if you're a follower of Jesus, you might just want to take a moment right now to place something back in his hands or to be reminded of who you are because of who he is. Perhaps even to ask yourself some more difficult questions. Am I living for his glory? Am I living intentionally for him? Or am I just ticking off religious boxes here and there? No, he wants so much more for you. He wants a relationship with you. If you're here and you've Never entered into that relationship with him. The way that you do that is by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. He came to show us what God is like. And there's no one he ever turned away. There's no one he ever turned down. He gave his life on the cross for every single person on earth that if we might believe in him, we would be called the sons and daughters of God. If you're here tonight, you've never believed on Jesus, but you want to know more of what it means to be in a relationship with him, in a relationship with God. We'd love to have the opportunity to talk with you. You can come and find me afterwards. You can come and find anyone that has the host tag around their neck. Those are people that are here for you. They love to pray for you, love to help you take your next step in following Jesus, whatever that might be. God, we worship you tonight. God, I take the words off the page and try to give a, a little application for our evening and for our days, but it just feels so inadequate because, God, you are so big. You are so worthy. You have given us so much. You've demonstrated. spite of how big you are, you're not far off. You are near. You care. You're a personal and loving God. May every single one of us know you in that way more and more. God, we give you access to make all things new in our lives every single day. In Jesus' name, amen.